Father, we want to thank you. We want to thank you for your presence with us this morning, this afternoon. We stand in awe of you. We stand in reverence for your holy name. We acknowledge you are here. And there is nowhere else we would rather be than to be with you. There is no better place to be than your presence. Father, we thank you for gracing us with your holy presence. It is not because we are deserving of your presence with us. It is your tender love, your mercies that never fail. So it has pleased you this day to tabernacle with us and to release unto us a measure of your spirit to do the works which only you can do. And so, Lord, we stand in awe of you, Lord. And we thank you. We could never thank you enough. We thank you, Lord. We appreciate you for all that you have done and for what you still will do and what you will continue to do. We thank you, Lord. Only you, Lord, could have done these things. So the glory belongs to you and to you alone. We honor you, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I had no doubt in my heart that God was going to do something special today. Maybe let me begin by saying that if you are not here, I know there are some of us that are online. If you can be here, maybe you should be here. Amen? That is, if you are within the physical or the geographical location that you can be here. Maybe you should be here. Because God is doing something special. He's doing something extraordinary. And I still believe that before we leave here today, God will do more. Amen? I'm not by any means 
suggesting that God cannot reach us across the airwaves. That's not what I'm suggesting. What, what I'm saying is that if you, sh if you can be here, you should be here. Amen. Thank you, Alison, for your very generous introduction. Sister Sybil is a woman that, that I hold very, very dearly in my heart. I remember her always. I have no question or no doubt at all in my heart that coming to Jamaica, Sister Sybil had a big role to play in it spiritually. I didn't know her, but having sat at her feet and listened to her and haven't, you know, haven't heard from her, I know that we, by we, I mean myself and my wife, my family, is a direct answer to her prayers. We are the product of her prayers in Jamaica, or part of the product of her prayers in Jamaica, as a part of God's pre-designed will and purpose. She is a bona fide, was a bona fide woman of God, no question, no question. She was a bona fide prophetess. She spoke, she saw things, she spoke, she declared things and they came to pass. Amen? I have been a beneficiary of that. Shortly before Sister Sibyl died, I had an encounter with her, and um, in one of, our, one of our prayer sessions, it was, I believe it was somewhere, somewhere up the hill. It must have been, I don't know whether it was around Peter's Rock, one of these hills towards Strawberry Side. And the meeting had ended, or was about to end. Sybil had said someone, at some point in time that, you know, I'm going to pray for you. I need to pray for you. And the meeting, you know, there was so much to be done in that meeting that day that she, I thought, I didn't actually pay it any mind or much mind. And the meeting was literally over and Sybil came back and said, I need to pray for you. She insisted on it. She prayed, I still remember the prayers very well. She spoke specific things which I don't even know if I'm at liberty to share yet. And shortly after that she, that, she took ill. You know, she eventually, she eventually died. I think a day before she died, or something like that, maybe a day or two before she died, I went to see her on the ward. She was on one of the medical floors, one of the medical wards at the university hospital. So I went to visit her. I think it must have either been the day or the day before she died. We chatted a bit. And she said to me, say to me, she must bring me some food or she must bring me some. Yeah, she said, say to me that I need her to bring me some food, some Nigeria food. And I think that day or the next day she died. She profoundly impacted my life by prayers and by words. She spoke things I'd never saw coming. I didn't see them coming, but she spoke them.
You know, I happen to be one of those persons that believe that the last things that somebody speak to you are probably the most important things they ever want to tell you. If you ever had the privilege of visiting somebody who is dying or who is transitioning, I've never seen anybody on their deathbed knowing they have fuels to leave, talk foolishness, as long as they are still cognizant. It runs through scriptures, it runs through life. When Jacob was about to die, he called for his sons, he called for for all his sons, and he said, gather around me, and I will tell you the things that will come to pass about your lives. And he spoke into the 12 tribes, not just the things that surrounded them. Most of the things he spoke had nothing to do with the 12 sons of Jacob but they were things that spoke into the destiny of the 12 tribes of Israel. It is Jacob who looked to Judah and said, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes. It was Jacob that looked to Joseph and said, Joseph shall be called a fruitful bull. He spoke destiny. That's what people do at their last moment. Moses, in the songs of Moses, in the last things of Moses in Deuteronomy, spoke to each of the 12 tribes of Israel. And when you read how the tribes were positioned, when you read the destiny of the tribes, every one of them is a fulfillment of the prophecy of Jacob and of Moses. So they are very important. I mean, it's a rare privilege. When my father passed, the most difficult thing I had to bear, and which I still bear from time to time, was not to have had the opportunity to sit with him at that last moment. I mean, that's one thing I, I looked to. You know, I kept saying, Lord, I don't want my father to die. I want to be able to sit with him because I know how profound it is to spend those last few moments. So, Maro, I just want to encourage you to have an opportunity to have your grandfather speak into your life. Is that right? Amen? That's not what we want to talk about today. We want to talk about some difference that the Lord leads us. And I also want to use this opportunity to thank you, Alison, and for everyone who have shepherded this church in these very difficult times and have allowed new things to be birthed. In preparing for this meeting today, one of the things I heard the Lord say very clearly to me was that. And I want to, I want to, I want to thank you. As a church, for years we struggled to establish a prayer ministry, a sustained prayer ministry. It was a struggle to get persons to come to prayer meetings. Like quite a number of churches struggled. Then came COVID. And then came online praying. And then came 
a birth. Something that was as evil as COVID, as difficult as it was, as challenging as it was. God, who being the only wise God, only God could have birthed a new dimension of praying in this house out of something as difficult as COVID. That could only be God, right? It could be only be the grace of God. And I'm not so sure whether we understand the fullness of the prayers that have gone forth in these times of darkness. Seeds have been sown that we haven't yet begun to see the fruit of those seeds. A lot of travail has taken place. Work has been done, but they have been done in the place of darkness. The last two years could be described as two years of darkness. But even in that darkness, there was treasure. Hidden treasure in darkness, and God has begun by his spirit to sow seeds in a period of darkness and lowliness that in the years to come that we will see the result and the travail of those seeds that were sown that many persons would not even remember those seeds. They won't. All they would see is the harvest of it. Amen? And I also specifically want to thank, in a special way, the women, the Deborahs of this house that have channeled and carried the ministry of prayers in this house and have led specific battles which if time permits us we will talk about amen michelle can you help us with this song speak O oh lord as we as we share Let's get the lyrics up. Speak, O oh Lord, as we come to you to receive the food of your holy word take your truth planted deep in us shape and fashion us in your likeness as a light of christ might be seen today in our acts of love and our deeds of faith. Speak, O oh Lord, and fulfill in us all your purposes for your glory. Teach us, Lord, full obedience, holy reverence, true humility. Test our thoughts and our attitudes in the radiance of your purity. Cause our face to rise, cause our eyes to see your majesty. 
majestic love and authority. Words of power that can never fail. Let the truth prevail over unbelief. Speak, O Lord, and renew our minds. Help us grasp the heights of your plans for us. Truths unchanged from the dawn of time that we echo down through eternity and by grace will stand on your promises and by faith we'll walk as you walk with us speak O Lord till your church is built and the earth is filled with your glory speak O Lord speak O Lord till your church is built till your church is built and the earth is filled with your glory one more time can we stand speak O Lord till your church is built and the earth is filled with your glory hallelujah Hallelujah. We can sit. In Mark chapter 10, verse 38, we read a story there. If we only read it in Mark, we probably would have thought that's how it happened. We see a request there made by James and John. They came to Jesus according to the version in mark asking a favor of him they said lord can we ask you one favor he said sure go ahead so will you grant it just promise us you know how when children want to put you in a corner sometimes and they come to you and to add, they want you to make a promise that you will agree before they make the request we are all familiar with that they said Please promise us you will grant this request before we ask. Jesus said, go ahead, ask. They said, well, the request is that we want one of us, when you come into your kingdom, we want one of us to sit on your right hand and the other one to sit on your left. Sounds like a very good request. Jesus said, really? He said, yes. But stick a pin and read the version in Matthew chapter 20, verse 20. Matthew tells us it, was, it wasn't actually John and James, the sons of Zebedee, referred to as the sons of Bonages, sons of Thunder, that made a request. The request was made by Mrs. Thunder herself. It was Mrs. Zebedee. Amen? It was their mother that actually came and fell at the feet of Jesus. I want you to understand the significance of that. When you read through the scriptures, there is not a single request that was made at the feet of Jesus that was denied. There's not one recorded in the scriptures. Let's take a look at a few of them. In Mark 5, 22, Jairus' daughter. 
Jairus came and fell at the feet of Jesus. Out of desperation, he said, my daughter is dying. And what did Jesus do? He followed him. Amen? In Matthew 7, 25, we see another request there. He followed. He responded. In Matthew 15, verse 30, the scripture says, All manner of sicknesses, the lame, the blind, the deaf, the dumb, those that were possessed with demons, they were brought to the feet of Jesus and he healed them all. Are you walking with me? In John 11, verse 32, we see Mary asking the Lord the same thing that Martha a few minutes ago had requested of him. We know of the story of Lazarus, right? Lazarus and his family were very close to the Lord. And, they were, and Jesus was told that Lazarus was ill. He stayed where he was. He didn't go until after Lazarus died. After Lazarus died, he said to his disciples, come, let's go back to Judea. And they said, go back to where? They almost killed you the last time you were there. He said, our friend Lazarus is sleeping. Let's go and wake him up. They said, well, if he's sleeping, you wake up. Why do we need to go and wake him up? He said, okay, let me just tell you plainly. Lazarus is dead. He said, but for your sake, I'm glad I was not there. He said, that it might be to the glory of God. He said, so, okay, you want to die, and let's go and die with you then. Since you have a death wish, and we will all just die. Let's go. When Jesus got there, while he was still some distance away, they told Martha, who was, you know, typical Martha style. She ran down there. Lord, oh Lord, oh Lord, see if you had been here, Lazarus would not have died. It's your fault. Jesus said, where is your sister? She went back to the house. Mary, the master is calling for you. What did Mary do? Mary, Jesus was still in the same place. He had not moved. Mary ran to where he was. And what did she do? The scripture says she did what? She fell at his feet. She fell at his feet. And she wept. And she said the same thing. What she said was no different from what Martha said. She said, Lord, if only if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And the scripture says, when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews that went with her weeping, Jesus wept. He said, show me where did you lay him. There is another record of a request that was not granted at the feet of the master. The last of them I would speak to, John chapter 1. When John heard and saw the risen Christ, where did he end up? At his feet. So Mrs. Zebedee fell at the feet of the master and said, grant me this request. Jesus said to her, you don't even know what you're asking for. He said, are you able to drink of the cup that I am about to drink? He said, yeah, we will drink. He said, are you able to be baptized with the baptism that I am about to be baptized? He said, we will be baptized. Just grant us the request. He said, very good. He said, indeed, 
you will drink of that cup. And you will surely receive that baptism. But to grant that request is not even in my power. They have been reserved for those whom the Father has reserved them. Why am I sharing this? Because this afternoon, we present a request before the Lord as we come through a season of prayers and of fasting and of petitioning, saying, Lord, ignite us. Set us on fire. Set us ablaze. It's a wonderful request. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good thing that we are asking. It's a good thing. But are we able to drink of the cup and to receive the baptism that is required for the request that we have made. Amen. And as we journey along a little bit, that's a question that we need to ask ourselves. If indeed the request we make of the Lord that we can drink of his cup and be baptized with his baptism in order for us to enter into that which at the end of this period of fasting and praying that we have presented to the Lord to say yes Lord we are ready amen and may the Lord make us ready in Jesus name Very often when we talk about being ignited for the Lord, there is an impression that we get is that we just suddenly are set ablaze and we begin to do some wondrous works for the Lord. Because the power and the fire of the Lord comes upon us simply because we have prayed and maybe hands have been laid on us. And certain things have been spoken into our life and gifts activated. We want to be burning torches for the Lord. We want to burn for God, and which is good. But there's a process. And in my own search with the Lord, and the Lord says there is a process. Perhaps we could spend a few minutes to look at this process of being set ablaze, of being burning torches for the Lord. The fire of the Lord to which we speak is only an expression of God's acceptance. Do you understand what I'm saying? When the fire of God falls upon something, and I'm not talking about the fire of consumption. I'm not talking about the fire of destruction. I'm talking about the fire of acceptance. When the fire of God or the power of God descends upon an individual or upon a sacrifice, it is an emblem, is an expression of God's acceptance. Amen? In the tabernacle, when Moses, in the wilderness, when Moses completed the tabernacle of the wilderness, and they offered sacrifice, the fire of God came upon the sacrifice, as a reflection that the sacrifice was acceptable. Amen? So much was the glory of God 
in the temple that not even Moses or Aaron could go into the temple because God's presence was there. A reflection of acceptance. In, I think it's Second Chronicles or First Chronicles, we see it again in Chronicles 7.15, Second Chronicles 7.15, when Solomon completed the temple, when he built the temple and completed the temple and everything was in place and he offered the sacrifice, what was the result? The fire of God came upon the sacrifice. A reflection of God's acceptance. How do we get from point A to point B where fire comes down, how do we get to that place of acceptance? God's fire does not fall on what God has not accepted. Amen? It doesn't matter how we try. When Elijah confronted the prophets of Baal, And he made the sacrifice. He devised a poor water, more water, more water. Before he finished speaking, the fire of God came down upon it. In Fox Kings chapter 18, a reflection of God's acceptance. Amen? When the two sons of Aaron, when the two sons of Aaron offered incense that they were not permitted, they were sons of the high priest. Fire came. But what happened to the fire? It killed them. Amen? It killed them. And Moses turned to Aaron and said, you dare not share that here. He was not even allowed to mourn his sons. He was not allowed to. He said, you cannot dishonor the garment of the priesthood that is upon you or the oil of anointing that is on your head. So you are not allowed to cry. You can't cry. You cannot mourn. You cannot cry. And he called the young man. He, he said, take them out and go and bury them. He said, and Moses said, don't dishonor your head. You can't do it. How do we get to that place where fire that we are talking about, the ignition that we are talking about, is an acceptable sacrifice? It's an acceptable fire. Isn't that what the desire of our heart is? The desire of our heart is the Lord set us ablaze. Ignited us again, your fire. But acceptable fire. Amen? It's a journey. Exodus 3 verse 5. Moses was a man that was born for a purpose. Even before he was born, or as soon as he was born, the parents knew he was a different child. The scripture says they were not afraid of the king's command because they knew he was a proper child. Of course, he tried in his own strength, became known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter, lived in the palaces and in the courts of Pharaoh until he fled ended up in the wilderness and became a shepherd. Then one day in Exodus chapter 5, he was shepherding around the mountain of God. He didn't even know it was the mountain of God. And he saw the, the burning bush. He said, what a wondrous sight. Let me go and see what it is. And as he turned around and walked towards the burning bush, 
the angel of the Lord spoke to him through the burning bush and said, stop. Take off your sandals from your feet. Don't come any further. He said, for the ground on which you stand is what? Holy ground. I'm going to talk about three processes as we journey towards where the cry of our heart is. Number one, the contamination. I'm sure Alison, is, being a microbiologist and an infectious disease, understands the processes by which you prepare things for use. Decontamination. As Moses approached that fire, the Lord said, remove your shoes from your feet. Make contact with the ground. You are beginning to step into our journey, and that journey begins with decontamination. You're contaminated. You can't come any close. Even though there was a purpose and there was a destiny, even though there was a calling, there was a signature upon his life, that heavens recognized, that heavens signed off on, he was contaminated and could not approach the fire. He could not. So there began the journey of Moses of decontamination. Remove your feet. Remove your stool. Make contact. Make contact from a distance. Amen? The scripture tells us about the kind of fire and water that purifies us and washes our conscience clean from dead works. But that's just only the beginning of the process. It's just the beginning of the journey. God calls us and he decontaminates us. He separates us from the things to which we are joined. When the process of decontamination is what we are experiencing, when we have encountered the fire of decontamination, sometimes we think that we have arrived. We don't arrive. Our journey just starts. You don't even begin to step into the next phase of experience, which is in a cleansing, stage two. As God begins to deal with the outward things, then he begins to deal with the inward things. So that sometimes, just by the mere fact that we are separated from some things, we think that is enough. it is not enough. It is not enough for the kind of fire that we are asking the Lord of. It's not enough. Then we move into stage two. Purification. The cleansing that is within. Amen? I dare to say that this is the most challenging of it all. Because of the processes that we have to go through. It is easy for us to talk about the things to which, from which God has delivered us. From the outward things that we are aware of. 
from the separation from friends or from the things that we had to give up. But in our journey, it is not enough. We step into the next phase. Which is what I refer to as a stage of deep cleansing. First Peter chapter 1 verse 7. The scripture talks about, you know, can somebody read that for us? Or I don't know if you can put it up for us. First Peter chapter 1 verse 7. No, First Peter chapter 1 verse 7. Yeah, I think that's. that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes though it be tested by what fire but what kind of fire i think it would be a good thing for us to perhaps look at the experience of some of the persons who have gone be before us and see whether our experience is parallel with them as we begin to walk with God in this journey to the place of being set ablaze. Amen? In Jeremiah, and I'm going to read that. Let me see if I can find that in my scripture very quickly. Jeremiah chapter 20. From verse 9 or from verse 7. Jeremiah was a prophet that did not need introduction. Solid. Prophesied not just only at individual level but at national level and transnational level. Spoke of things to come. Spoke to kingdoms and nations. So he was, he was established. But it did not stop the process of God working in Jeremiah to be the vessel that carried the fire. Amen? Are you with me? Jeremiah chapter 20 verse 7. He said, oh Lord, you have deceived me. He said, I was deceived. You are stronger than I. And you have prevailed. He said, I'm in derision all day. Everyone mocks me. For since I spoke and I cried out, I cried violence and spoil because the word of the Lord was made a reproach unto me. The word of the Lord became what? A reproach unto Jeremiah. We're talking about the struggle of the prophet. It became so bad for Jeremiah that he said, I will not make mention of him again. I will not speak in his name. Say, but what happened? Say, but his word in my heart became as what? A burning fire. Say, they became fire in my bone. The cleansing that is within is the fire within, which is the word of God. There is a fire that is within, that is lit by the word of God. In Luke chapter 24, we remember the two disciples that were walking on their way to Emos. We remember them? And Jesus joined them and started walking with them. And they began to talk and they asked me, are you, are you, are you a stranger in Jerusalem? Haven't you heard about all these things that are happening? And he said, what things? And then they began to tell, them, tell him about this Jesus whom they thought was going to be the Messiah. But how he, he was killed and now we are hearing all kinds of rumors. And then he began to expound and to show them the scriptures. When Jesus broke bread with them 
and revealed himself to them, what was their response? See, did not our heart, what, burn within us when he made known unto us the scriptures, the fire that is within him? As the Lord begins to transition us and move us from one stage to the next stage, then we begin to encounter things that are within our system, that are within us, that is fire. When you read Jeremiah chapter 20, or you read Jeremiah chapter, I think it's chapter 24 or so, you see what is referred to as the midnight cry of the prophet. Jeremiah cursed the day that he was born. I mean, he wept. He said, why did I not die in my mother's womb? Why was I not born as still? Why wasn't I born as stillborn? Because of the reproach that he had to bear simply because of the word of God. See, my life has become a shame and a reproach. And we know another man who had such an experience. You can remember another man who had such an experience? Brother Job. Job was a good man. He was a good man. The scripture says he was a perfect man. There was not a single person in the whole land of the east at that particular point in time who was better than Job. And within a couple of days, within a couple of days, he lost his children, he lost his wealth, he lost his friends, he lost his status, he lost everything. And in Job chapter 2, Job cursed the day he was born. He cursed the person that went to his mother and, or his father and gave them the good news that a, a son has been born. His experience became so bitter. It became so unpleasant for him. He did not understand what was going on in the heavens. We can read it retrospectively. Not for Job who was living the experience. We are looking back. And we know the story. We know there was a conversation between Satan and God. But Job did not know that. He didn't have the privilege of that kind of information. Then he was hit with health issues. His health began to fail. And his wife said, curse God and die. Say, when are you going to put an end to all of this? It was not a nice experience. He was undergoing the kind of cleansing that was so deep. The kind of experience, it was the fire that was going on on the inside of him was a refiner's fire. And there are times... When God is dealing with you, it is not even an issue of sin. It, is, it was not an issue of sin. Job did not sin. It was not because Job did something wrong. He did not. You know, we pray certain prayers. And just like Jesus said to Mrs. Zebedee and to the two boys, are you able to drink of this cup? He said, do you even know what you're asking? That's what he asked them. He said, do you know what you're asking? He said, do you know the cost? Do you know the cost of what you are asking for? Are you willing to pay the price? Are you willing to undergo the transformation of separation that it takes to encounter the kind of power we're talking about? Let's say we will. 
we will. Hallelujah. Are you still with me, brethren? Hallelujah. You know, God is not a partial God, you know. God is not an unfair God. The very things that he asked of us, he did not spare his son. He did not. Jesus himself had to undergo the same process. Are you with me? He had to. In Hebrews chapter 5 verse 7, the scripture says, he cried with bitter tears to him that was able to save him from death. And he learned obedience, what? By the things he suffered. In Gethsemane, we see three, three things taking place in Gethsemane. You know, he went into the garden of Gethsemane with all the disciples, all of them. When he reached a point, he said, the, the eight of you, eight of you here, you sit here. And then he took Peter, James, and John. He said, the three of you come. They went a little further. He said, okay, the three of you here, you pray here. No, you watch. Watch. That's what they said. Watch for me. And then he went a little further alone. And he alone began to agonize in prayer. Sit, watch, pray. What was the difference? The difference was the distance. As you begin to beseech the gates of heaven, as you begin to knock on the doors of heaven, as you begin to say, let the heaven rain, let it open. Let power be poured on us from on high. Then the Lord says to you that the way to the upper room passes through the porter's house. We want to reach the upper room. We want the fire to fall upon the sacrifice. The 120 of them that sat in the upper room, they were living sacrifices. They were living sacrifices. We want the fire to fall upon the sacrifice. Say, but that road passes through the porter's house. You remember the porter, right? You remember the story of the porter in Jeremiah? Very nice story. Hallelujah. In Jeremiah chapter 18, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah it says, go to the house of the porter, and the word of the Lord is waiting for you there. Amen? He went to the porter's house, and as he stayed and looked at the porter's house, he saw the porter walking on a, on a clay. But as he put the clay on the thing that spinning and spinning, he got mad. The final product was mad. It was mad in whose hands? In the porter's hands. And what did the porter do? He took the clay, smashed it, and started all over again. We want to show up in the upper room and say, fire, fall on me. Holy Ghost fire. Hallelujah. I want to work miracles. I want to declare the word. I say, excuse me, sir, did you pass through the porter's house? It's a porter's house. 
Where is that? When you put the lump of clay in the potter's and it begins to what? Spin it around and around and around. And you say, Lord, have you ever reached a stage in your life? You say, Lord, I feel like my life is going round and round. Lord, I feel dizzy. I feel dizzy, Lord. This experience is making me dizzy. Lord, I throw up. Lord, I, I feel giddy. I'm unsteady. Lord, I'm not even sure anymore. Nothing makes sense anymore. I thought I knew these things. What I thought I knew, I suddenly I don't even know whether I know them anymore. Are you... Are you, work, are, you on, are you working with me? The potter's house. And then when you think it's all over, thank you, Jesus. I don't come through the spin. And then the potter look at it and they say, it's not right. What is going to happen? You're going back. It not, it not, it not, it not, it not, it not, it not perfect. Why? Because we have this treasure in earthen vessels, in jars of clay, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Because these jars of clay, they carry an excellent power. And so, you have to go through the porter's house. Jesus went through the porter's house. In Zechariah chapter 11, verse 13, there was 30 pieces of silver. That was what they paid for the life of Jesus Christ. And what did the Lord say to the prophet? He said, throw it into the porter's house. He said, take the 30 pieces of silver see, and put it in the porter's house. The price that was paid for him. When he reached that point, when his own will as a man, as a man, when his will came in direct contrary, conflict with the will of God, you think the cross was something that Christ wanted to go to? Think again. He did not want to go to the cross. He went to the cross in obedience to the Father. When he wept in Gethsemane and said, if it be possible, if there is any other way, then let this cup pass over me. If there is any other way that eternal salvation can be bought. Because he saw the horrors of the cross. He knew what awaited him there. And said, Father, if it is possible. You think easy for man to sweat blood? It's not, it's not figurative. It is real. It is not a figurative expression. It is a medical terminology that when you are under so much stress that the blood vessels that wrap around your sweat gland, they begin to rupture into the sweat gland and you sweat blood. That was his experience. The burst. That was the intensity. It was intense stress. That the very blood vessels that supplied his sweat gland began to rupture. And the sweat came out mixed with blood. And he don't reach the cross yet. Why? Why? So that he could offer up what? A perfect sacrifice. An eternal sacrifice. So that fire could fall from heaven. Hallelujah.
there is a fire without that decontaminates us. There's a fire of decontamination. That is not anointing. That's a fire of decontamination. Then there is a fire that is deep within. That is shut up within your bones. That wrestles with you. That's a fire of cleansing and purification. And then there is the fire for service. There is the anointing for service. So how we can just skip from here so? And just jump straight to an outpouring of fire. So that we can be regarded to as the men who have turned the world upside down. I don't see anywhere in scripture it goes, oh. Doug, you see any? You don't see any. I don't see anywhere in scripture. It don't, it don't work like that. If God did not accept imperfect sacrifice then, you think he will accept them now? Amen. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, my God, that is a scripture that is a scripture. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4. It says, therefore, seeing we have this ministry, We all want the ministry, right? The ministry of reconciliation. The ministry of healing and of power and of raising the dead. Fantastic. And God wants us to have it. So, but therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, so we faint not. So, but have renounced the hidden things of this honesty not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by the manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Say, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid from them that are lost, in whom the God of this world has blinded their minds, which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Say, for we preach not ourselves. But Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. Say, for God who commanded light to shine out of darkness has where? Shine in our hearts. The very hearts of darkness. All right? Has shined in our dark hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. In the face of Christ. So birth. We have these treasures. Where? In jars of clay. In earthen vessels. That the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. So we are what? Troubled on every side. We are chastened on every side according to NIV. Yet not distressed. So we are perplexed, not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Paul is describing the process of the earthen vessel, the potter's house. So we are chastened on every side. We are carrying the excellency of power. But how we get there? See the experience of the potter's house. 
Say so we are hedged in from every side. So what kind of trouble? The kind of trouble some of us already have experienced. And some continue to experience. Sometimes we don't even understand it. See my pastor there. I don't think in 1998 when Pastor Roll went to, went to the farm, to the fish farm. Never know what awaited him that day. We could write scriptures today. I could say, Lord, why me? What was my sin? What, what was my offense? And just as we thought, okay, at least we get over the hurdle of the gunshot wound. And wrap, run around and wrap around and a hospital and surgery, fixation, Miami, rehabilitation. Praise the Lord. Everything say okay. And have the interview on forgiveness. And attending, you know, call to speak here and there and talk about, you must be a, you must be a one. How, how do you forgive these people? How does it feel? I remember I went with Pastor Roll to a church the night then bam the stroke. Troubled on every side. Cast down but not destroyed. Are you with me? So it wasn't only Paul. We experienced it too. It's just that we don't know the kind of language in which to write it. We don't know the kind of language to write it. I went to Bruce and Alba's house the night she was short of breath. I admitted her to the hospital. When the pain was unbearable, I said, okay, you know what, let's go into the hospital. None of us, in our widest imagination, none, knew she was not going to come out of the hospital. Not one of us knew that. It was not in the equation. We never bargained for it. We didn't. Are you with me? Cast down. I had to walk to Pastor Bruce to say, Pastor Bruce, I need to speak with you. Yes. You're just going to buy something to come back and say, Pastor Bruce, I buy no more. I'd have had people to catch him. Almost dropped dead on the spot. She's gone. I say, Lord, this was not, we did not have this plan. You remember when we, when we talked about growing up together and getting old together and what we're going to do with the children and the grandchildren after, them, <clears throat> after those two, three, you know, Young people gone on their way. We had plans. This was not part of it. Are you with me? It happens. The process of maturation that some persons experience to come to the place. I don't have the answers for it. I don't know why God chooses the things that he chooses to transform us. Amen? I don't know why.
So when, when we read in the scriptures that you know, they took handkerchiefs from Paul and they used them to cast out demons, it didn't just happen like that. This was Paul's experience. The handkerchiefs did not just cast out demons like that. Let's read it further a little bit down and see what Paul has to say. It says, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in us. Paul said, well, we are living cops. That's what you're saying. So we're dead men walking. That's what we are. So for we which live are always delivered unto death. For what? For Jesus' sake. That the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our what? Mortal flesh. That was the problem. So the only way the life of Jesus could be manifest through this corrupt, unredeemable, totally decadent mortal flesh was to be a walking dead. If power was going to exude, and by power I mean pure power, then this veil had to be rent. So then, verse 12, death walketh in us, but what? Life in you. So maybe we need to ask ourselves the question again. Do we really want what you have? Do we really want to pay that price? When Jesus says, nobody who loves his life, his mother, his wife, his son, his daughter, more than me, is worthy of me. That's what he was talking about. I'm not sure that the disciples had any clue what he was talking about. They had no idea. But when they encounter the power of God, what God has to offer, in exchange for our lives. Nothing is comparable. Nothing. Nothing is comparable. Let's read it further again. Hallelujah. He said, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. Say, for all things are for your sake, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. For which cause we faint not. But though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is what? Renewed day by day. And he concludes it in one sentence. He concludes, the 39 stripes save one five times. The shipwreck, the danger of men and false brethren. He concludes the near-death experience, the mockery, the shame. All of that, he has only one sentence to conclude it. He calls the word light affliction for the moment. It's a, it's a but, it's a, this light affliction, which is for a moment, is nothing compared to the eternal weight of glory. That shall be real. So they saw something. Before we talk about fire, we need to see something. Because the cost of the fire, is, it, it is costly. Let's be, let's be honest with ourselves. It is costly. 
and Christ mixes no words about it. He didn't tell us it was not going to be costly. He never said so. He said, for some of you, it will cost you your father, your mother, your child, your husband, your wife. It will cost you. There is the cost of the cross. He said, but guess what? There is an eternal weight of glory. There is no way you can carry that cross if you don't have a glimpse of that glory. If you don't see that eternal weight of glory that is to be received, revealed, you cannot bear the cross. Not even Jesus could have borne the cross if he did not see the glory that was going to be revealed. The scripture says that he bore it because he saw. He saw the glory that awaited him. Are you with me, brethren? We need a new understanding. A new perspective. Some things are easy to say. We could talk to the mother who has lost her son. Or whose son is not walking in the Lord. Who have prayed for 10 or 20 years or 30 years. We could talk to the wife whose, 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 whose home is crumbling. We could talk about dreams that are shattered. We could talk about so much. The porter's house is not a pleasant experience. I'll conclude, even though there is much <laughs> to be talked about. We all remember when Solomon's temple was being built. The scripture tells us that this house was being built. The house of the Lord at that time. That at the temple site, you didn't even know any construction was taking place at the temple site. No noise at the temple site. Zero. Quiet. How did they manage to achieve such a wonderful feat? Because they prepared the stones somewhere else. The stones were prepared at the quarry site. And then they were transported to the temple site. And every stone that was brought to the temple site was cut to feet. So all the cutting and all the, all the, all the cutting and all the whatever needed to be done was done at the quarry site. And then it was transported to the temple site. In 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 7, Peter says, we also are what? Living stones. And we are being built, is what? into a house of the Lord as a royal or a holy priesthood to do what? To offer acceptable sacrifices unto God. Living stones. Living stones also go through quarry experience. Just as the temple of Solomon was built, that's how God is building his house today. In fact, Solomon's temple was a replica of that which is in heaven. It was a replica. God showed David the pattern in heaven, and David gave it to Solomon. But the true house of God, because we know that God does not dwell in house built with human hands. The true house of God is built by living stones. And living stones pass through quarry. You are cut to feet. But the problem, we want to appear at the temple site without a quarry experience. We want to be at the upper room. We want cloven tongues of fire. The baptism of the Holy Spirit for service. Power beyond from on high. We want to confront kings and speak things into being. But we don't want to pass through the potter's house. Yes. 
Anytime God put us in this, hey, Lord, no, 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 Lord, it's enough, it's enough. Take me down from this wheel. I train up. I vomiting, I vomiting already twice today. It's done. I don't want to be spinned. My life giddy already. Enough. I want us to stand together as we pray. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. As we, you know, during this season, this, this is a unique season, but God is about to, I believe God is about to launch us as a church into another experience. God is about to launch us as a church into another experience. But we must be willing to embrace it let's not fool ourselves it is not without cost he never said it was without cost he did not say so and anybody that comes up and preaches a gospel that is without cost is a liar it will cost you forgiveness costs it costs. Do you know what it cost Stephen to forgive those that stoned him to death? Including the great apostle himself? It cost him. It cost him his very life. So if you're not prepared to forgive, forget the fire. It's not going to fall. And it is, in fact, it is for your sake that it doesn't fall. Because if the fire falls on you, it will consume you. Like the two sons of Aaron. You don't understand. You don't understand what he did to me. You cannot appreciate my pain. I know. I can't appreciate it. But I'm not the one that says, neither will your father in heaven forgive you if you do not forgive. I didn't make it up. So you, you have no clue what has happened. It's easy for you to say and to preach it's not my gospel <clears throat> brethren as a church if we are <laughs> if we are going to make the next leap if we're going to make the next leap we must have count the cost we must must count the cost and we must decide if Jesus is worth it Are you with me? It's a conscious decision. We must decide if he's worth it. Hallelujah. Is he worth it? All I ask tonight is, Lord, show us your glory. We need to see something. We need, we need to see 
even a glimpse of this eternal weight of glory in our spirit. We need to know what we're contending for. We need to understand the price that you have asked us to pay. We need to understand this price. If we don't have a revelation of it, Lord, we need a revelation of it. Hallelujah. Are you with me, beloved? Michelle can help us with worship as we pray, as we commit ourselves to him who is able to save us. Wasn't that the experience of Jesus Christ himself? I'm not enough unless you come. Will you have to be me enough. Again. You have to be enough. For you have to be enough. All you are is all I am. Will you meet me here again? enough unless you come will you meet me here again cause all I want is all you are will you meet me here again I'm not enough unless you come. Will you meet me here again? Cause all I want is all you are. Hallelujah. Will you meet me here again? Not for a minute was I forsaken. The Lord is in this place. The Lord is in this place. Come, Holy Spirit, dry bones awaken. The Lord is in this place. The Lord is in this place, not for, not for a minute was I forsaken. The Lord is in this place, the Lord is in this place, come. Talk to the Lord together. You are here. Let's 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 stretch oh, our hands to God. God is able to call us. Minute, Hallelujah. You are able. You are enough. You are enough. The Lord is in this place. 
the Lord is in this place. Come, Holy Spirit, dry bones awaken. The Lord is in this place. The Lord is in this place, not for a minute. You never forsake. sometimes we come to a place we don't even have words to describe our experience we don't have words when at times that the spirit of God is contending with our will and we can't find words to describe the struggle in my heart that the power of God is here to, to help us. God's power is here and as we open our mouth and talk to him, as we open our mouth, as we close, bring this meeting to final closure, as we open our mouth, as we spread our hands before the Lord God Almighty. I don't know what your experience is. Maybe this is not for you. Maybe you have no such experience of contending with the spirit of the living God. Of your will in direct confrontation with the will and purpose of God. But that's okay. But for those of us who have we want Meet to lay hold of that grace. That's, we want to lay hold of that grace. Because we want to finish the race. And we want to finish well. We want to finish well. And we want to experience the power that is to come. We want to experience the promise of the Father. We want to experience the power that was promised. We want to offer acceptable sacrifices. Acceptable sacrifices. The kind that draws power from heaven. Acceptable sacrifices. We want to be in the upper room. But we have no intention of bypassing the potter's house. We want these vessels, these jars of clay to contain excellent power. We want these earthen vessels to carry the power of the living God. Yes. So if this jar of clay needs to go back on the wheel, then so be it. So be it. Until you bring out a vessel that is acceptable before you. That you can say, yes, this vessel can carry my treasure. Oh, hallelujah. 
Ali Señor, help us. Ali Señor, Hallelujah, Holy Spirit of the living God. Hallelujah. Come, Holy Spirit. We just ask for an outpouring of your grace, your grace of supplication to be released on us this afternoon as we sing. We ask for a release of your presence as we worship you. As we submit ourselves to you, Father God, we ask that you pour out upon us. Pour out, oh God, upon us. We ask for an opening of our eyes. May we see, may we see your glory. May we see your eternal weight of glory. May we see the prize. May we see what you want us to see that you've asked us to contend for. May we see what you have asked us to pay the price. May we see what you have called us. May you grant us a revelation of your power. Oh God. Help us, Lord. Help us. Father, we cry out to you this afternoon. We ask for help. Father, we look to you, our help, our hope, our strength, our desire. Father, we ask this morning, this afternoon, Lord, that you would touch the crusty places in our hearts. Father, the places, oh God, that have become hardened because of disobedience, hardened because of rebellion, hardened, Lord, because we have come forward and then pulled back, come forward and then pulled back because we have been resistant, Lord. We've been reluctant to pay the price. But Lord, you have visited us again today, Lord, and you've walked, oh God, amongst us, Father, and you have opened our eyes, Father. You have stirred our hearts again, Lord. You have touched us again. Father, you've given us again the desire to hope, the desire, Lord Jesus, to pick up back our cross, Lord God, take it back up, oh Father, and to walk according to your will. Father, we freely confess that we do not embrace pain, oh God, with joy and thanksgiving, but Lord, we want to embrace serving you with joy and thanksgiving, Lord, and we want to ask you today, Lord God, to help us, Father, to hold, to walk through the pain if it is necessary, to walk through the potter's house, as Kelvin has put it, Almighty God, so that we can come into the things that you want us to come into. Father, move among us, we pray, Lord. We pray for the persons online as well. Move amongst us this day, Almighty God, as a group. Father, open the eyes of our understanding that we might know what it is that you have called us to. Father, I pray that you might help us. Lord God, move. Move in the hardened parts of our hearts. Melt resistance, we pray. Melt resistance in my heart, oh God. Melt resistance in our hearts. Father, where we have come to a certain point and then pulled back. Father, I pray that you might help us not to be content wandering around in the wilderness, but cause us to push through, almighty God, to allow you to have your way in us, to embrace the path that you have chosen for us, oh God, so that we might come through on the other side, fulfilling your purposes, oh God, and being true ministers of your word. Father, I pray that you might have, a, have, have your way, have your way in us today, oh God. Father, move in our midst, move in our midst, almighty oh God, online in this room, move in our midst, I pray, oh God, and break down the pockets of resistance, Lord, that nothing in us would say, not that way, but my way, but this day, Lord Jesus, I pray that we might truly bow before you, 
and we might say not my will but your will almighty God Lord that we might look you in the face today oh God and say father we surrender father we surrender we confess that we have tried to run away from the dealings of your spirit Lord we confess that we have come to certain points and then when we see the price we turn back and then we wander around but father we pray that today the wandering will stop God we ask that in a mighty work of your spirit the wandering will stop oh God as you give us grace in the deepest innermost places of our hearts to surrender to surrender all to you oh God father to surrender all to you to surrender all to you oh God that your fire would fall and that your fire would transform us oh God and cause us to be living witnesses of that power that we so long to exhibit to the world oh God but we must needs go through we must needs go through so father this day I pray that you might release that power in us oh God to go through so that we might come out on the other side as powerful effective true witnesses of the mercies of the living God Lord do our work do our work in our hearts do our work in those deep crusty places break up the cross oh God break up the hardness almighty God break up the resistance we pray Lord Jesus and cause father that we would embrace your dealings Lord we would embrace your dealings we would not rewrite your work oh God but that we might accept what you have said and we would re we, we would embrace your dealings so that we might be effective witnesses of your power of your grace father move in us we pray cause this to be a watershed moment in the life of the church almighty God in each of our lives let this be a watershed moment oh God that we might embrace your way not our way not reword your way to make it our way oh God but embrace your way father and trust you for enduring grace and enduring power to go through to pass through the potter's house and to come out on the other side to be effective witnesses of your grace and mercy father do it for us we pray because there is no way we can do it for ourselves but we yield to you and we give you permission Lord to work in our hearts to accomplish your purposes through us we pray in the name of Jesus Hallelujah. 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 Father, we lift up this assembly to you, Lord. Lord, we pray that you create in this assembly a culture and a heart that seeks your will above all else Lord. Father we ask of you Holy Spirit of the living God we want to see you Lord we want to see your power we want to see your power that we want to see the power of God made manifest amongst us we know we know without a doubt that there is the power of God we know we know, we know, we know. We have seen glimpses of it. We have heard, oh God. And we have seen the ripples of the water. We've seen showers of mercies. We've seen mercy drops. We know, we know, we know. We know we have not believed cleverly designed fables. We know, we know. We know it's not made up. It's not made up. Lord, we want to experience your power. Beyond that, Lord, we want to be carriers. We want to carry it. But we know there is a price to be paid. We know the kind of vessels that are containers of your treasure. That's where we buck up, Lord. That's where we fail. And so this afternoon we come before you, mighty God. We present these jars of clay. Everyone. 
one of us, Lord. Every one of us. We present these living sacrifices. We present these living stones, Lord. We remember when you said difficult things and many disciples walked with you no more. And you turned to the twelve and said, will you also go? Peter said, to whom? You have the words of eternal life. To whom shall we go? We present these living stones, Lord. We say, cut us to shape. Cut us to feet. We don't fit, Lord. We don't fit. We know sometimes we don't fit. We present ourselves at your temple site. But we can't find where we fit. Because we have not been shaped by your quarry. This afternoon we say, Lord, may you catapult us into our new experience. As individuals and as a house, we don't want to bypass your process. We don't want to bypass your process. So we ask of you, oh God, this afternoon, by the mighty working of your Holy Spirit, that you will not hold back your hand, that you will shape us, Lord. You will mold us, you will form us, you will fashion us, and you will fit us as living stones to where we belong, in your house. In your house, being built up into our holy edifice as a dwelling place of God by his spirit, a royal priesthood, a holy priest where sacrifices that are acceptable are continually offered up unto you, Lord. That is the house that you have built. We want to fit. We want to fit where we belong. What is it that you want to cut out, Lord? Cut it out. By the mighty working of your spirit, Lord, contained with it. Cut it out. Father God, the things that we think are so dear and so near, that are inseparable, the things that our souls have become bound to. Cut it out. Only you can do it. We can't do it ourselves no matter how we try. We're not able to. But you can, Lord. You can. Can we rise together? Lord, I just want to present your people to you. Present your people, Lord. Everyone that stands here this afternoon, every representative household, every church, every family, everyone that is under the sound of my voice Lord we present to you is there anything that is too difficult for you circumcise our hearts unto obedience Lord we release the power of your Holy Spirit this afternoon in a new measure in the name of Jesus Christ as your people stretch their hands to you, may our hearts also be stretched out to you, Lord. That in this season of waiting upon you, Lord, that you will renew our strength to pursue you even harder. 
Lord, that this season, O oh God, that the things that you are about to birth will not be stillborn. You say, if the clouds be gathered, they will empty themselves upon the earth. May these not be clouds without rain in the name of Jesus Christ. As we see clouds gather over us, may there be showers, oh God. In the name of Jesus. May there be showers, Lord. Oh God, we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. May this be a new season. Open our eyes that we might see you and the power of your resurrection. Open our eyes that we may see you, Lord. Because we want to see you. How can we do it if we don't see you? Give us a revelation of yourself in your word that we may know you and the power of your resurrection. How? How? For we must see you, Lord. Revealed, Lord, in your word that our lives may be ordered by that which we have seen. That we may be true witnesses because our eyes have seen the Lord of glory Lord we ask that we will encounter you again wherever we need to begin may we begin there if we need to take our shoes off to make contact oh God may it be so but Lord show us where we need to begin in our pursuit of you oh God in our pursuit of you, may we do it wholeheartedly. May we do it wholeheartedly, Lord. May our hearts pursue you. May you look down from heaven and be pleased. May the disposition of our hearts please you, Lord. May you be happy with what you see because of the disposition of our hearts towards you. Then let your deliverance flow. Let your salvation flow. Let your healing flow. Let your grace flow. Father, we thank you. Make this house a new house. May our culture as a house change. As we seek you, Lord, in prayers, week after week, Lord, may our culture, may there be a seismic shift in the atmosphere. May our culture as a house change. May everyone that walk through the door into this place be able to say truly, God is among you. May the power of your presence be so evident that is a God is among you. And we pray, Father God, may prayers be answered in this house. May you be pleased with us that prayers and petitions that are offered here, may they find favor with you because of your great love and your great mercies. Lord, we 